Welcome to Wish I Could Play, a podcast dedicated to people who have always wanted to get into tabletop role-playing games, but have never had the chance. My name is Morshadi, here to say you can. Hey, it's Morshadi. As you can probably tell, I haven't released an episode since June. I recorded this episode in July, but unfortunately because of life, I haven't released it. I'll be releasing this episode in two parts, first the interview, and within the next week or so, the second half containing the game we played. Apologies for not updating the podcast, and I'll hopefully be posting regular updates soon. Thank you very much. Probably got a big old notice. Hey, someone's recording. In this episode of What Wish I Could Play, we are not going to be talking with someone who is new to the tabletop space, but is an experienced GM and player. David Easley, keeper and host of the Trials of the Apocalypse podcast. David, thank you so much for being on the podcast. How are you doing today? I am doing rather good today. I am super happy to be here. Uh, I've been looking forward to this all week, and I'm, yeah, I'm feeling pretty good. I am low on water, and I will regret that later, but for now, I still have enough, so. Sure. I mean, you always, always walk away to the, from the table. I can oh, yeah, the yeah. The entire time. That's also the best thing about recording. You can always, you know, you can always just <laughs> stop. Everything can change in post. Indeed. Um, let us, you know, tell us a little about yourself. Sure. Um, where do you want me to start? I'm uh, six foot three. Uh, <laughs> yes, but use your sign. Do you, um, uh, do you like taking long walks off the, off a short pier? Like things like that. <laughs> long walks off a short pier? It's not a yeah. very long walk if I go off the pier, you know? We're That's going true. right in the water at that point. Um, oh, geez. Well, uh, as was mentioned, I, I host a show called Trials of the Apocalypse. It's what I'm best known on the internet for, um, where we do... We call them one-shot stories. They are sometimes a little bit longer than that, but they're short-form stories in different Powered by the Apocalypse games. Uh, We've had a tumultuous time trying to switch to doing some live stuff for a while while the podcast is on hiatus, uh, and eventually we will make more live content. But uh, for now, uh, we're we're just sort of coasting. We're we're hanging out, talking to people, and uh, playing games when we can um and uh today we're we're gonna have a little bit of a chat and then play a little bit here i think yeah let me you, let me ask you a question um yeah now i have been following the trials of the apocalypse uh since you initially posted about it a long time ago yeah it H- seems so h- far hilariously early you were like in yeah. like the, the first i think four or five people who actually like heard the show who weren't personal friends of mine like yeah in, yeah in no yeah, i think life. you posted it on a a uh, yeah, use the either the Power by the Apocalypse group or Monster of the Week group. I can't remember which one. Yeah, uh, saying like, "Hey, we've got this like you know this podcast." Sure? I was like, "Oh, I'm looking for another one." And then uh, <laughs> you know, I, I was hooked. Why did you choose specifically PBTA to focus on? Because that's what all your arcs are. It's all yeah. Apoc- Apocalypse World, Undying, um, for the Wood Bay, you know, right? For the Wood Bay. Uh, it's uh, our order no, no. so far. I, I think I can. I think I can still do this. We're we're getting up there, so it gets harder every time. Uh, so far, we have Apocalypse World, Undying, Ghost Lines, Brindlewood Bay, Monster of the No, The Watch, Monster of the Week, um, Pig Smoke, and the Between Ghosts of El Paso. Yeah, I might have dropped one in the list, but I think I think no, that's all. I think that's no, it. I think you got them all. Uh, yeah. So we, I say we. <laughs> this this whole show was my i, I want to say the self-deprecating side of myself is like my dumb idea but it's actually a pretty good idea i think um we we here being uh me and uh my wife emma who's also like my creative partner in many many things um like i'd been running at that time a lot of D, but i'd like experimented out in some different systems uh and had a lot of uh positive feedback from from running those and enjoyed playing those and uh, I really wanted to explore more uh, PBTA games because I uh, heard a little bit of uh, some folks playing Monster of the Week and was interested in that. Um, I had been looking into other systems and a lot of them that I was like, oh, that sounds really cool. Like, oh, that sounds really neat. Um, kept coming up and like, they were like, oh, Powered by the Apocalypse, Powered by the Apocalypse, Powered by the Apocalypse. And I was like, maybe I just like this format and, and this like, uh, I, I say format because like, PBT is actually bigger than that. It's it's a lot more about like the design philosophy uh, around how a game should should play, uh, mm-hmm. rather than these specific mechanics. But 
I was just really intrigued by a lot of PBTA systems uh, on my short list at the time of ones that I wanted to play. The most were from PBTA. And I was, I realized as we were uh, conceiving of the podcast and uh, trying to figure out what our angle was, um, I definitely wanted to do one shot stuff. I wanted it to be very inca- like self encapsulated because at the time I was a novice both to running games on mic uh, and also like podcast editing. Um, and uh, I wanted people who were new to the show to be able to join us on whatever arc we were currently playing and then go back and listen to stuff if they wanted to and wouldn't feel like compelled if we were doing like a long, you know, 30, 50 episode plus story. Uh, then now somebody has to go back and listen to the early stuff, which might not be like as good as the recent stuff. Uh, and I wanted it to, each arc is its own and you can go and listen to them if you want to, but there's no you know impetus. You don't have to, to understand what's going on later. Um, so with that decided, I was like, well, this still feel, I feel like this idea could be a little bit tighter um, and the like sell to somebody who's giving up their time to like listen to our show could be, more clear it's like what we're offering could be clearer and so i decided that it'd be it'd be cool if we actually like limited our scope and had like a little bit of an educational angle um obviously like when we get to the actual gameplay i I think we're hardly an educational show uh but we do like try our best to explain the systems that we're going to play and uh be transparent about how we do our our world building and stuff during setup uh, and that's kind of like the educational bent for people who are interested in learning about a new system. And then for people who are just there to like hear an actual play story and and hear this Im- improvised story play out, then they can just listen to the gameplay and, and hop right in. Um, and we settled on Power by the Apocalypse purely because there was just like a dozen of them that I wanted to play at the time. And I was like, you know, if part of the goal of this podcast is to let me run more games uh, in more systems, then I'm just going to, this seems like a really rich vein to mine. And uh, I'm happy to, you know, swing my pickaxe there and, and see what I dig up. Oh, it definitely is a rich vein of mine. I have an entire G drive full of them. <laughs> so, so was the, was Apocalypse World the first one that you've run and GM'd or, or played and GM'd or? A- did Apocalypse you play one? World was the first Powered by the Apocalypse game, uh, it, true, true to form, uh, that I ever ran. Okay. What about played? Um, the monster of the week was the first one I ever played. And that was like a year later. Uh, I, <laughs> <laughs> so you, you just full on just dive into I the, dove into right the, in into the uh, deep end. Okay. The first time I have ever run a PBTA game is on mic for the first, you know, for the first arc of the show. Um, and goodness gracious, by the time we got to the end of that, I, I still was like, okay, I feel like I kind of get what's going on with PBTA, but like, there's definitely a lot of like holes in how I, I executed this. And then sometime midway through Undying, it like, especially like that one is like very different handling yeah. of, of PBTA principles. And like about halfway through that game, I don't know what happened. Just in my brain, it just finally clicked. And I was like, oh, that's how all this works. That's how like this is all supposed to work. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think ever since then, like there are times when I've missed a particular mechanic or something in a, in a game because we don't have time or uh, I forget about it. Uh, but for the most part, I think at that point, I I know it feels weird to say like, oh yeah, second game in, I knew what I was doing, but I knew a lot better what I was doing than when we started, uh, because that was very jumping in, jumping in cold water, right away. Yeah, and that, and when that's that's what I love about about Power by the Apocalypse because every single one always adds a dimension to it, right? Like yeah. Because my first game that I also uh, did was I jumped into and in running. A convention game of monster of the week that has been the that was the first time i'd experienced anything wow cold, and I cold decided, open monster of the week at a convention that is tough yeah not only that i ran three three games of of monster of the week uh my first game was only like i think four people signed up because no one had heard of mm-hmm. it and then that snowballed into my next game and i got ended up getting two of the same players and then four more because <laughs> they brought people in and then my last game of the convention, I ended up, and this is a mistake for any peop, anyone who is a who is a new GM, especially empowered by the apocalypse. I I had already I had set it out to be a max of five people at per table, 
but it was the one of the last games of the convention and i had some people who were wanting to play and then people who had had missed out on the beginning the first two games because they were also jamming i was like yeah sure why not go ahead and jump in and then people who had already played so they knew how to play and i was like uh yeah sure i ended up with a table of eight people oh my god for monster of the week i have run uh one it it was ostensibly the start of like a mini campaign, but we quickly realized it was untenable. I did start a table that had, uh, it was either nine or 10 people. Um, it was raw hubris that thought that that would work. Um, it and, did not. And, and it can, but the problem mm. is, is that it, in a convention setting. Oh yeah. It was like, like new people who so haven't played hard. together. Yeah. And, uh, and a lot of it though is, I don't think I've ever had the same experience twice when it comes to a convention game, because at least with that one, I would probably say it's my most successful one. And also the one that um, it was the hardest, it mainly because I had two players. One was a, it was a dad and, and a daughter, and she mm-hmm. was just like the quietest, like mouse. She would only talk to her dad like and she wanted to play. I think she played the spooky. Yeah, she played the spooky. It's great. was like, yeah. And he was, I can't remember what it was. I think it was, uh, it was a monstrous. No, wronged. He played the wronged. And he was like a ghost cowboy. <laughs> and she was like this teenager who is now attached to him in some way. And like, it just keeps him in line and keeps him in check. Would barely talk. I would try to bring her in and she would give her... It, what she would want to do to her dad and he would say what it was totally fine yeah. I, you know however people want to play is that's fine this table was huge and so i'd have like side conversations going on constantly and then eventually people started actually lining up around because they were just like what the hell's going on over here this is a huge table and i was <laughs> like oh my god <laughs> so other conversations what was great about it though was because i was listening to the side conversations i was able to bring in stuff at the same time because they were talking about like oh yeah i got this character blah, 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 blah. like they're part of the mafia blah, 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 blah. and i just like when i go back they didn't mention that they were part of the mafia and i just bring it in that they're you know someone from the mafia is coming after them like they're wanting they're wanting to do this that or the other and i'm like they were like what i was like you were just talking about it you're at the table this is fair my success, <laughs> yeah my success story on that is by the end of it uh this daughter was like yelling out her what she wanted to do she was like jumping up it's like that thing of like like yeah. when they throw out, throw down the cake and everyone like she ended up killing the monster with the final blow and everyone just exploded it was fantastic apparently her dad told me that she had just the most fabulous time and she wanted awesome. she wanted to buy the book that is so good that's so that's such a good convention story yeah and i it, that's that right there is the reason why i run convention games mm-hmm. is for that so um i don't know where i was going with that <laughs> but it's okay <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good place to start it is uh, a good place to start but that oh that's right the differences between all the games so yeah. monster of the week was one i ran for a long time mm-hmm. and that was pretty much all i would i would run and then I was like, well, there are other games out there. And I, I started buying more and more and more. And I think in terms of changing the way I run games and changing GMing, the two games that made me like that switched for me mm-hmm. was Monster Hearts and Dream Askew. Mm, yeah. Monster of the Week is very like formulaic. I, I, I call it the, the meat and potatoes of PBTA. <laughs> it's very like you can just lay everything down. Everyone know everyone knows like, hey, it's the beginning, middle, and end. Done. Yeah. Right. But like Monster Hearts and Dream Askew are both by Avery Alder, they have this like depth to them. And mm-hmm. even if someone doesn't want to run them, I always recommend those two games as something that you should have in your toolbox. And it just kind of like improved things for me in for my for my for my GMing, at least with with PBTA. Yeah. I Every Alder writes incredible stuff. I know. Um, the Quiet Year is my favorite new game to run for people. I, if, if I'm running with people who have like never played a TTRPG before, mm-hmm. um, I love to start them with The Quiet Year because it's like immediately graspable. 
Um, the role play is like there, but it's light. So you don't have to, if you're not like comfortable, you're not familiar with how to engage with it yet. Um, it's, it's, it doesn't demand as much from you, but it's still like, it gets your brain building. Um, I don't know. I, and, and that's like just an example. Uh, I, I've, I would love to play everything that Avery has ever made because everything that I've read has been fantastic. Yeah, their 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 design philosophy for most of their games is just it's almost a, I everything that I've read um that I that I own at least it's almost mm. it it strikes me as it's like this is more very much more than a game. Like take the game yeah. out of it. Be more about who you are, what you are, what you're representing and mm -hmm. then play the game. And that's where I that's where my mindset changed. I was like, these are characters I that should matter. And that's and that's definitely where it where it clicked for me. In terms of what you said just said, actually, yeah. um, for people who have never played a game, you use the quiet ear, which is a game I've always wanted to play. I have the PDF, but I don't have I want the cards. <laughs> I I found one of the like Kickstarter sets in uh, a game store near me. So I, I have the cards. I have the nice burlap sack and the little, the little skull tokens for uh, contempt. Yeah, it's great. It's fantastic. Nice. I can see why that would definitely be good for someone who's never played uh, mm -hmm. an RPG, especially getting him into that map building and, and that lore building and the RPG building. And I like, again, meat and potatoes. I like using Monster of the Week as an introduction yeah. for people who've never, because it's very good. Everyone has a yeah some media touchstone to some kind of supernatural-ish something, either a book, a movie, TV show, anything. It's, it's very open and very wide. But there are definitely some PBTA games out there that are not player-friendly. Player have you run across any of that? That you wouldn't, um, you'd be like, oh, no, 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 you can't, no, we can't. We got to put that one back. You're not, you're not ready for that. I, I would like two that come to bra uh, brain immediately are uh, I think Undying is not one you should probably play first because uh, for people who aren't familiar with like the, the pace of conversation in a PBTA game, um, the lack of rolling is going to be really confusing. Um, actually, I guess I would say for, for anyone who's like coming new to PBTA, und Undying would be a very confusing offering. Mm -hmm. um, if you're like familiar at all with any other RPG, because like there, there is no dice rolling, um, how the pace of play, it's like very implicit. Um, there is of course, like the, the other ways of controlling outcomes with like blood and um, the betting and stuff, but it's pretty atypical. And I feel like people who don't already have a pretty firm foundation uh, are going to be at want trying to figure out like what to do, like, they're going to be focusing they're, they're, too much on the mechanics than the playing yeah, itself. It's, it's, going, it's yeah. going to be hard to figure out how to engage with it. Um, but like once you do it, like I, Undying is a great game. Um, it, it's a dark game, but it's, it's a great game. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that anti-system, that blood anti-system is really interesting. That, it's also the hardest part to, to get yeah. nailed down. And uh, But yeah, once you get it, get it straight in your head, it's like, oh, okay, okay, that makes sense. And it makes for like super all or nothing encounters, which is like very intrinsic to how it thinks of vampires clashing. So it's it's fun. Mm -hmm. It's a good game. Um, that one I would say is like not terribly uh, immediately friendly. Um, the other one that came to mind was uh, any like, not necessarily any, but some short like single pager or like the one that popped in my head was ghost lines which is a four pager uh, by john harper it's a fantastic game lots of great tech in it um but if you if you haven't already run or read or otherwise played apocalypse world or really any like kind of core mechanic uh pbta system um it's it is it just doesn't have any of that keeper advice or information um mm -hmm. or player advice or information and so like if you just read it and you have no other context and then you go to play it uh you're you're going you're not gonna have a bad time because like there's still lots of good game there but you're going to have a confusing time um because you're not it's not immediately apparent how when these roles are called for or how they work or like so at any time where you don't have a lot of that description there that that sort of keeper or player advice um i think that can make it harder because like as i mentioned i played apocalypse world first and Apocalypse World is the system that started it all. Uh, and uh, 
it has lots of really good keeper resources in it. And still it wasn't until like my second PBTA and beyond where like things started to click for what it wants from you. Um, and I think people who are coming in cold, it's just like, it's, a, it can be a little bit. So it's like handing a complicated tool to someone without any, any instruction manual. Yeah. Uh, you, you really need the instruction manual if it's like your first, you know, touch with it. Um, actually, I feel like the people who <clears throat> do the best coming to PPTA for the first time are people with either a theater or improv background. Um, specifically because a lot of those like warm up games that you have in those actually play a lot like a PBTA conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if you already have a background with those, then it's, I think, an easier transition. Um, whereas, weirdly enough, if you have other gaming background, uh, specifically with more sandbox oriented systems, like, for example, D&D, &D, um, but really any in that fairly broad category, um, coming to PBTA can be a bit jarring at first because mm -hmm. of its like narrative first approach instead of its sort of sandbox resolution it's physics you know based approach and uh, i i say that and there's like somebody out there already who's like throwing their fist in the air and they're like well my my D, &D table is very narrative forward and like as somebody who has like a very narrative forward D, &D table it the game still plays fundamentally different yeah uh, very different, and yeah. uh well, it, i wouldn't say very different but different yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it, it's a different experience. And uh, if you don't know, if you don't have, especially if you don't have somebody like experience to kind of like bring you into that, it could be tough. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, I think Monster of the Week is a great like introductory to PBTA, although there is like a lot of, there's a lot of depth to it. Uh, so, but one of the nice things about Powered by the Apocalypse, uh, at least how it's usually implemented, is generally speaking, players only have to know their playbook and barely that. Uh, yep, in order to play that. and so it makes it easy to onboard new people like it's a great convention game for sure yeah yeah monsters leak is the one that i i, I get to um convert D, &D the the quote-unquote D, D bros yeah because they're like oh whatever man you only use 2d6 and i was like yeah here man which one do we want well what's this one? Oh, that's the one that's like xander from buffy yeah i'll do that one and then they <laughs> end up it's the I get the craziest results whenever so whenever someone plays mundane and they're a DD D D person because they try to do things but they don't have powers. And I'm like, that doesn't mean anything. The mundane is the most powerful playbook in that game. Yeah, it's the, <laughs> it's the second. I don't know. I don't know if anyone knows this out there who's listening, but understand that the mundane is the secondary keeper. Yeah. If you read it, they're also a keeper because they can create things with their powers. They can create things in the narrative. The mundane is like reading through it. It, in exchange for not being air quotes the coolest character in Monster of the Week, you are the most powerful because, like, it, I mean, it, it's it's the archetype, right? Monster of the Week yeah. is about Monster of the Week stories, and the character who doesn't have the powers has to have the most narrative power because otherwise they'd be dead in this world. Yep. Uh, and so, as a result, yeah, no, they're super. PBTA in general eschews balance as a as a hard concept. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that's a, a pretty clear take from the system. It, it's not really about. It's not that there's like no sense of balance. It's that balance yeah. is not the not as important when you have uh, the conversational structure that it has. Um, yeah, and that well, and that's like that comes down to like um, like what kind of playbook versus playbook were the uh i think the term what is a uh, pc even evenness yeah yeah where all the playbooks are basically the same they just fit a different role right mm -hmm. um or like the mundane where it's like the least powerful character but they have yep. other things yeah um yeah I, I i i discovered in amongst my uh researching you david a very nice little uh pdf about oh. all that stuff <laughs> since we talk about what systems are not what other than i mean i like i said for mine is monster of the week what would be the one that's yours that you'd be like okay you want to play pbta let's 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 break this out i can uh, i could do this tonight what's your go bag pbta my my go bag pbta is brindlewood bay um because most people i'm around are down to get their granny on uh, sorry sorry for anyone listening uh 
Brindlewood Bay wow. is uh, <laughs> Brindlewood Bay is a game where you play retired old ladies in in the titular town of Brindlewood Bay uh, who solve their local murder mysteries as part of their book club. Um, and there's also this underlying hor- like cosmic horror element as there is this uh, cult that is trying to uh, bring back a, a child of Persephone and like all this crazy stuff happening under the scenes. But that's all like part of the set dressing and only matters in like a long-term campaign but it means that even your one shots are can, can end up in a very weird as hell place um and uh, for me the simplicity of brindlewood bay because it is it is the basically the tightest version of the card from brindlewood mystery resolution system um and yet it still has all the trappings necessary to evoke a really distinct sense of genre uh, for anyone who's seen Murder, She Wrote or watched The Golden Girls or like has any sense of that kind of catty, conversational, cozy, creepy mystery stuff, um, it it is immediately evocative of it. And even if you aren't, it's a really easy genre to grasp. Um, and yeah, the system's just so easy to explain. It's like so quick to write up characters and it's so quick and collaborative to write up characters, but not as lengthy as like say uh history questions are in uh, apocalypse world or monster of the week which can get a little bit like they're, they're, they build more depth of course but they're not quite as fast as like the the whole group helping to assign cozy places uh, cozy place items in brindlewood bay which is a lot like quicker of a process um and since the mystery itself um all you need is the trappings you need like your clues your your suspects your your premise um to me, it's a lower prep alternative than most other systems because, I mean, yeah, I, I can either grab a, a pre-made out of the book or one of the ones that I've worked on, or heck, I could probably just crank one out off the dome uh, for a, a Brindlewood Bay game and with no prep, bring people into the system and, and play. Um, but it's also one, I think the system that's best for a one shot is the one that the person running it is most experienced with, within reason. There are still some systems that are tough to run for a one shot, but within the category of games that are like okay for doing it it's the one that like you know you're most familiar with because Brindlewood Bay at this point is the game that I have run the PBTA game at least that I've run the most uh and so I'm I'm just at this point like it's a well-oiled machine I know how to do it and it's pretty easy to dive in so you said earlier that Monster of the Week is the first PBTA that you ran yeah um what what was the first one after that one after that one was Epilion, if Ooh. I remember correctly. I've wanted to play Epilion, but I haven't gotten around to it yet. Yeah. And so all of my, mo- most of my gaming running games mm-hmm. have all been either at conventions, online Discord servers, or for charity or AP streams. Gotcha. I don't have an at home group. Mm-hmm. I don't have anyone nearby, nearby me. Even when I did have anyone nearby me, I didn't ever get together like where my energy for gaming comes from is i i'm like an energy vampire in conventions Mm -hmm. i like the more people who are around me who like are having fun the more energy i have the longer i can go the next convention that i ran that i was like okay i need to do something different need to bring in something other than monster of the week what do i bring in and i had just gotten an order for masks Epilion and something else. I can't remember what it was. Masks is another I haven't had a chance to run yet. Yeah, I have opinions on masks. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Epilion, and so I got that. I got both books, which it's such a great little game. Um, and I love the second book. If you don't have the uh, the, the Draconica, get that because it's got some okay. great stories in it. And it's got the stories are written in such a way that they're prompts for a for a game but it's Mm -hmm. like lore stories oh cool this is the story of how we discovered this blah 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 blah. and then it's a prompt for like your characters to go discover it and so i'm just like sitting there going oh my god this is so amazing no i only have the base game all right i'll take yeah so i ran that one at the convention as well um because it just comes with everything right okay you get little doodads because each person gets like 10 little gems i brought mm-hmm. those in little little baggies i got from the dollar store brought a big, big piece of you know 
butcher paper and like I drew an outline of the of Dragonia and I was like, yeah. okay, here's here's what we need. Like here's do this, 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 this. And I was like, just start marking up the whole mark. And I was like, I walked away for a second, let them kind of handle themselves, came back and the map was just like, holy hell, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> and then I also bought the deck of cards. Mm-hmm. And so I didn't really have any kind of plan other than the fact that the characters were all uh, hatchlings and it was their first day of of getting a uh, their first mission, essentially. Yeah. And so as they are heading up, I'm like just describing them going to the Great Hall and they're all just like doing whatever. They get there and I just like toss a bunch of the cards on the table. And they're like, what the hell's going on? I was like, these are all the people that are looking, all, all the, you know, all the ones looking for hatchlings to do things for them. I was like, you need to start searching for things because other hatchlings are there. And I'm like pulling cards away, pulling cards away. And I'm like, there's not, not many left, not many left. And so they're like scrambling and they're trying to decide because they're all, you know, they're all siblings, right? From the same mm-hmm. clutch. And they're just like arguing with each other like siblings would and until they finally chose one and I just picked up and like used it from there and then I ended up using the cards later on and like some were like were like weren't those ones in, uh in the hall earlier I was like yeah and they got sent on a mission and now you're trying to save them and so it was a really great experience after that I think I started running I have so many games hold on <laughs> what did I run I try to run something new at least in half of my games that I run at whatever mm-hmm. conventions. If I either, if the normal ones that I go to always expect me to run Monster of the Week, I get messages saying, am I coming? Are you running Monster of the Week? I'm like, yeah, I'm running a one game of Monster of the Week. <laughs> Other people have started running it, so I've actually pulled back. Yeah. But I always try to bring something new to the table. Like mm-hmm. last last year, I uh, I ran sleep away yeah which is very hard to do in a convention setting middle of the day (laughs) when people can't hear you Mm -hmm. and talk about um having a hard time explaining the mechanics of like say something to the effect of like uh, not being able to roll things and undying trying to break that role play mechanic and that for all that and then swap it out to sleep away and how sleep away works that did not go well (laughs) it it's it's a little bit of a harder one to do as a sell for uh as a convention game again i think i i might find a different belonging outside belonging to bring Mm -hmm. um and try to do maybe a little longer of an hour slot but makes me wonder how this kind of sparked my brain well i wonder how difficult it would be to run something like bluebeard's bride at a convention uh because like since like all of the pcs co-own the one actor Mm -hmm. um the 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 the, what's her name the bride the the bride that's it Mm -hmm. um like i wonder how hard that would be to bring to a new table so I know that that one's run pretty regularly at conventions, especially ones that uh, Magpie Games is at. They, oh, I mean, they look yeah. For. yeah. Um, I know somebody who goes to conventions and runs it on the regular. I think it's probably one of the most beautifully designed books and games oh, out there absolutely. In, yeah. in terms of PBTA. I think that if uh, if I was willing to run it, it probably would be pretty successful. It is a hard concept and a hard game to run and i don't think i could ever run it as a public game yeah Um, it's also like a high prep game in my opinion if you want to like have a really satisfying um i don't think so um maybe i don't have have you read it i haven't so i've i've read it and i've planned for a time when i was going to run it but then that table Mm -hmm. ended up not being able to we kept delaying and it just then it just never happened as you know the the horrors of <laughs> ttrpg uh planning um but so I, i've prepped a game once um and i i found that but uh, you know i don't run it all the time maybe if i ran it a few times i'd be like oh actually i can cut corners here and here and this is actually all that i need yeah and that sort of thing oh yeah yeah i mean like if you 
if you did run one of the run for a little longer yeah but i mean for for a four hour game i i've seen it be pretty run very well uh now there are people who run it all the time i just personally on a personal note, i don't think i could run because of the material yeah it's tough. um it's just it's a tough it's a tough hard a hard one for me to run mm-hmm yeah. So, uh, but that one actually would be interesting to see. I I've always wanted to play it at a convention setting just to see how it would work. I've only ever played it remotely. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it loses something there too. Same thing with like ten candles. I've run. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. I've run ten candles at a at a convention as well, and it was at like middle of the night. And another thing uh, is for anyone who wants to run ten candles again, don't do it in the middle of the night. I know it's like, but everyone's <laughs> tired. And when everyone's rolling really well, like the game stretches on <laughs> and you can only go, you can only do so much. <laughs> then you get to 2 a.m. You're like, okay, I'm, guys, I'm calling this. <laughs> I'm blowing out the candles. We all die. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, we all die. I'm done. <laughs> Have you, what do you think there is something that, that keeps people from not liking PBTA? Now there have been like, mm-hmm. I've had some people and they said like, oh, yeah, I've had just, I, I, I still don't like BBTA, blah, 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 blah. Uh, no reason given, right, mm-hmm. at conventions I've been to, but, and it could just be they bad, had a bad experience. But what do you think is uh, maybe parts of the basic tool set of PBTA that keeps people from not liking it? I, I actually think the biggest thing with PBTA that can keep people from not liking it has nothing to do with the games themselves and has a lot more to do with the culture around pbta as a as a movement i guess um i think that a lot of people who sell pbta to other people not like literally sell games but like people who try to get other people into the fold of playing them um i have noticed there's like some some pretty hard antagonism among them against other game systems Uh, not naming any names, but especially those made by Wizards of the Coast. Um, And that energy, at the end of the day, when we like things as people, um, it is very easy, it is very natural for us to invest some part of ourselves in that thing that we like. And so when other people are saying there's something wrong with that thing that we like, a lot of people can take that as there's something wrong with me, or these people think that there's something wrong with me. And we don't like it when people say that about us. Uh, And so the response can be kind of negative. Uh, From what I've seen, from my observation of the TTRPG and specifically PBTA sphere, at least on the internet, um, it seems to me that the, the group of people who are very counter PBTA are mostly that way because this is going to make sound like I'm making light of it. And I'm really not, but like, because their feelings have been hurt by the way that some people in the PBTA community talk about things that they like. Um, and then as a result, they're like, Oh, well, I don't like your thing. Um, and, and then they won't engage with it in good faith. Now, then there are some people who've had like negative experiences at PBTA tables. And I think for some people, and actually I have a, a player I play with on a regular basis. It's actually appeared on the show. Um, Gwen, uh, she plays in some, uh, she's actually part of the long-term D&D campaign that I'm so nearly done running. Uh, it's been a little over three years and we're almost there. What I, I had an end in mind for this game when we started it and it's just taken a lot longer to get there than I thought. Um, but it's been, it's been good. But uh, she has a very strong background in D&D, like in several different versions and, and all of this. And when I first like had her play some PBTA stuff, um, it's not that she didn't like enjoy engaging with it. And that's not, it's not that she doesn't like very good at playing the game and, and like engaging with what it delivers, but also for her, she likes the more traditional gamification at the table as well. Like, like in, in D and D it's like a, it is as much like a video game RPG as it is like a tabletop RPG, which is instead of having the computer do the decisions and have the limits instead you roll dice and there's the conversation and the the game master who sort of arbitrates how the rules are enforced and that sort of thing. But at the end of the day, it is like much more sandboxy. And there's some people who just really like that level of detachment they get to have. Like PBTA in order to be at its best demands that you engage on a like personal level in the narrative. And some people don't 
want that. It's not that they don't want to be significant. It's not that they don't want to affect the story, but they mm-hmm. want to do it at a little bit more of a distance. And uh, that's fine. Like that, that's, but I think that also can drive a wedge because PBTA asks certain things from you. And some people just don't like giving that as much. They prefer other ways of engaging with um, sort of role play at the table. Uh, and, you know, that's, everyone's got their own tastes. Listen, you can't do everything in D&D. I'm just sorry. No, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, <laughs> no, I do hard agree. agree. Um, but it does, it does do what it does quite well. Um, and that's why people, I, and <laughs> might be a hard take, but it uh, might be a hot take. Maybe you shouldn't you know, share this or whatever. Uh, but I think the reason why D&D is so successful is less because uh, uh, its systems are remarkable. Uh, not that they are bad by any stretch, um, but it's less that their systems are remarkable and more that their timing and positioning and financial backing have always been in the right place to catapult them to greater success as opposed to, sometimes it's all about like timing and D and D has had it in ways that other systems have not. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing, right? It's like, and I agree with you. There is a very, uh, some groups online and in different locations, whether it's on Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, uh, things of that nature that are very, uh, delineated about, well, no D and D bad, my, my thing good no D and D's fine your thing bad um and it's it, it really is hilarious though to, to go come across a post and they're just like you know this like this story would be really great i wonder if i can do it in D. it's like but that game is right there right in front of you okay fine whatever <laughs> just 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 don't ask me about converting things for you please because i will just point you in the direction of of a last uh, an awful seat thank you all right yeah Let's just, the really sad thing to me about that is there's a lot of people who adapt certain things for D and D, and I know in my heart of hearts, like I, I thinking from like a, an actual play, like a podcast perspective, there's a story they want to tell, and they adapt that setting and stuff, or they adapt D and D to better suit that setting and stuff, as opposed to using a, a system that is kind of from the ground up more baked towards what they're trying to do, because D and D has such hegemony in the market. Mm-hmm. It's it's so big, uh, and I and the, the sad thing is that that's from a like a reach perspective, that's still probably the right thing for them to do. Yeah. Um. And and that's so that's such a shame that like I don't one one thing I don't know, and I'd be interested to hear your perspective on this. Why do you think that tabletop is as like tribal as it is? Like it, it is a it, communities are very focused. There's not actually, I mean, obviously like the sphere that I have surrounded myself with are people who are pretty pluralistic when it comes to the games they're willing to play. But there's a lot of people in this community who just are not that way. In fact, I would say like the the bulk of people would rather stay in one system basically forever. And like, you don't get that with like video games, but for yeah. some reason that's kind of the norm with tabletop games. And I'm wondering why you think that might be so i'm going to come from this from a from a historical on my my home historical viewpoint mm-hmm. and um and from what i've seen in my in my experience running games for channels and seeing a little bit of glimpse into the ttrpg industry space yeah my first experience with TTRPGs was trying to get into a long running group of people who were running 3.5 because mm-hmm. they were like, we're looking for another person. Have you ever played? I was like, no, I've never, I, I know about D and D, but I've never played. I've always wanted to. And they invited me to the group. Well, they were the, those, the typical neck beard mm-hmm. grognards who yeah. just didn't want to share anything. They were offended that I didn't go out and buy all the books i was just like they're so expensive i can't afford to right now can i just borrow your book to create my character like i just need to and they just and i never came back so from that moment on D &D was a stained thing Mm -hmm. for me like i did not want to do anything to do with D. &D. came back to it 2018 17 Mm -hmm. something like that went to a convention uh in salt lake city and there is this thing called adventurers league 
And I was like, what the hell is this? All right, all right whatever. And they had like a ton of just pre-gens and you could go to any table that started up at that time and like you can just sit at it and just play and you didn't have to know anybody blah blah it was so fantastic ran a couple games for them i joined their 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 guild friends to this day mm-hmm. from that i jumped from that D over to the other side D, i can run it i'm still part of playtest groups and all mm-hmm. this kind of stuff but it's not my bag of tea yeah, I, yeah. I know it's because of what happened 20 some odd years ago now comes to today most of the games that i play or run are pbta games mm-hmm. i am very much this is the game set that i want to play this is what i like yeah. now this is the reasons why i like it right it's very free form it's very one shotable it's i don't like being in long campaigns mm-hmm. um like I, I'm very much hit it and quit it when it comes to GMing. Like people have asked me to run a campaign for some of the games, and I'm like, I am not the person you're looking for. I just <laughs> like coming, coming, doing my thing, and then leaving. I'm the guy who comes into town, shoots up the people, and leaves with his, you know the bullet hanging off of you know his guts spilling out, riding off on his horse. Like that's who I am. Um, but that's like that's why PBT fits for me. Mm-hmm. So I wouldn't necessarily say that people are tribalistic about it. What they are is they found what works for them. And like PBT has worked for me. Now there are other games, obviously, but I'm not like going out there and running Alice is Missing every day. This is yeah. not like there, there isn't an Alice is Missing universe game sets. There isn't Powered by the Missing, you mm-hmm. know, um, even though there should be Spencer Stark's <laughs> games are amazing. This one will make it. But the, for the most part, again, my entire library is PBTA to the point where it's mm-hmm. probably I, I I really should should never look at my history of my billing because that would be pretty sad. <laughs> I don't know where I was going with this. I do that a lot, but no, it, uh, tribalistic. Um, so I don't think everything is very tribal. It's just more. It's worth what's comfortable, and being comfortable is nice. I like being comfortable. Everyone likes being comfortable. Yeah. Everyone likes that rut, right? You get you get that ass group going, you get you're really set in there, and having to and being exposed to another another game, being exposed into another system, when it's especially when it can seem radically different, mm-hmm. puts people in a, into a position of being uncomfortable that people want to avoid. Like, think- especially like if they're coming from a Dean, like you were saying, D&D background, yeah, yeah. Where they're a little separated going into PBTA where they have to embody that character and yeah. think of that character. They're being called that character. Many, 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 all of the PBTA games say, do not call your players by their name, call them yeah. by their character name. You know, they're being, they're embodying this person. And then on top of that, they're being uncomfortable because of the new play system. They're uncomfortable because they're not using all the dice they're normally used to. Maybe mm-hmm. a new player group, that right there, just just lends more to the. You know what? I'm just going to stick to. What yeah, I know. I, there is a certain joy in rolling twenty die six or 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 fifteen d eight because you you know just got some crazy damage in D anD D or something like that. I I see. The oh, see, I thought you were that. I thought you were going to be talking about Shadowrun. No, there's no joy no. in having to roll fifty d six. No. <laughs> My shadow road story is fun. We'll get to that in a second, actually. Uh, but I think what I'm taking away, uh, I th- thank you for sharing that perspective and and like kind of how your journey has brought you here because I think the answer, at least the one that I'm gonna take away from this conversation to that question, is that one of the core differences between playing something at the table or playing, you know, an online game or or just playing any kind of D and D, like any sorry, any kind of uh, video game. Uh, is it can only be conducted with other people. Like y- your your interface isn't even the dice and the paper. It's it's actually the conversation. All tabletop games are governed by that. Um, some of them are less explicit about it. Like, of course, PBTA are very explicit that this is a conversation and that's how the game is done. But like, at the end of the day, it is so people dependent. Uh, and you like talked about how like you had this pretty negative experience with relating to D and D, and like even now that like still affects you. And if I like had a bad time playing like 
I played Final Fantasy one and had a bad time and then played Final Fantasy 14 and had a good time, my experience of those games would not really be related to one another, even though like as a franchise, like I might've had a really rough time with that one, but like, oh, well, I had a good time playing this one. And it's not as close. It's not as personal, but when, once you get other people involved, we're like hardwired to connect and be influenced by an influence and like be emotionally engaged with other humans. And so the stakes are just a lot higher, I think. And that, that could contribute. Here's the thing though, when it comes to that comparison right there in Final Fantasies, the say <clears throat> Final Fantasy one was your first JRPG yeah. video game. The, the types of games that are coming out at that time mm-hmm. that are all the same kind of games like looked very different than what Final Fantasy 14 looks like now. It's true. So you might like what looks what it looks like. The aesthetics mm-hmm. matter, right? And so you may have played Final Fantasy 1 and like I really don't like this and like the story was going to so you just kind of wrote off all types of JRPGs at the time because they all mm-hmm. kind of clone were all clones honestly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They all just had different stories. So you're like, "Oh, that kind of looks like Final Fantasy 1. I, I don't want to play that." But 14 now does. <clears throat> excuse me um so along the same lines right aesthetically they don't want to play pbta because it's not it, it doesn't fit what their aesthetic feels yeah. like on the it, it doesn't match the aesthetic they know and enjoy exactly but the play are probably still the same characters right they're still playing mm-hmm. with the same players they're still playing with the same people just one person where hey you know what i'm running gaming next month can we just can we play this instead because yeah. that's something i run across a, a lot when it comes to posts it's like i'm running this but they always want to play this can i is there anything that's <laughs> similar to this that uh can i do that but it, it isn't pathfinder <laughs> yeah that is i think uh, actually was one just recently uh <laughs> Just because it is real quick and I'm thinking about it. My my Shadowrun experience was spending five hours at a table, people putting together characters and never playing the game. Yep. And that was it. Like that's, <laughs> we spent an entire afternoon setting up for it. And they're like, all right, then we'll go and we'll play it, you know, uh, in a couple of weeks because we got a, something in between. And then we just never came back and played it. So I've like, I've created a path, or sorry, I've created a, a, a Shadowrun character and that's what I've done. <laughs> six hours we played for six hours and in most of that time was creating characters we ran one part of a heist and i was the what's the one that's the jacker the mm. oh, it's been too long i can't Hacks remember there. i can't remember yeah the tech runner or something like that. i can't remember what it's called and deck, i was just deck like runner maybe? i think so it's like and anyway. like i was like okay how many d6 do i i was like i don't have that many <laughs> it was started up higher i was like it i was like I was like, you know what? I'm scrubbing this. And I pulled out my phone. I just started sitting there. I was like, I got this. I was like, I'm not going to. Because all, all we had at the time, I had my regular dice and we had the little uh, Warhammer. These things. Mm-hmm. That's all we oh, had. Yeah. And I was like, I'm not picking each each one of these up and going in to see what I got. I'm not. Here, here's what I got. There, there. Because <laughs> you can find those kind of calculators. Mm-hmm. No. Was there ever any session that you had? any game that you you ran whether on the uh on this on your podcast or not that mm-hmm. you were just like oh god this is gonna just be terrible it would actually turn out to be really amazing oh man i uh, I'll, I'll do two stories uh one one short and then one podcast related um i the first time i ever ran fate uh i was i was running out of fate accelerated i think is their quick start um mm-hmm. and Fate has actually, it was one of the first non d d systems I ran. Um, it has been actually hugely influential on how I conceive of um, table and scene dynamics uh, because of like how it considers aspects as a thing of like characters having aspects and the situation having aspects and like how, it, how those work in that system is really uh, novel. And if anyone listening has never played or read Fate, you should. Uh, it, it's something that's very helpful to have in your toolkit for how you think of things as a, as a GM or as a player. But I was running Fate Accelerated, and I'd read over it. And then I had a table uh, of like, mostly just like some close friends uh, that was going to be coming over. And I was like, hey, everybody, and I slapped it on the table. We're going to play this. Um, I have read it. I do not have a scenario in mind. I want you to make just your 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 most out there characters just just give me like the roughest stuff to work with and we're going to tell a story with this today 
um, and they were on board and we did that. And I going in with basically no prep, hardly understanding the system, just the, the, one of the characters, this is so uh, Pat, he's my brother. Uh, he's been on the show several times. Uh, he created a, a character called uh, Captain Hands Fur to Hands. And uh, Captain Hands, uh, he <laughs> was just this guy who I guess like at some point had his hands amputated and now they were like sentient and they like could do their own things. They like floated around. It was a very strange character idea. And then somebody else was like, oh, that's a cool. I'm going to play one of his hands. And so then somebody else was playing one of his hands and there was like somebody who's playing a cat. It was like the 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 table of nightmares, not of dreams, as far as like characters. And we ended up doing a story where we were uh, trying to run for mayor of Hell, Michigan. Um, we're trying to become the mayor of Hell, uh, and uh, slowly our setting developed into this really weird version of the United States. It, like very very strange, and it it was. It ended with like a, a, a meteor, a like meteor, a, a meteor composed entirely of meat heading towards the earth. Uh, and how did I know you were going to say that? It, <laughs> it was to this day, uh, I remember so many details from that one shot, not because like I was ready or it was particularly memorable, but because like things just worked out in a remarkable way. Um, it's one of those times where uh, I learned that. Sometimes you just have to trust the system that things like it has been designed in such a way that it will resolve somewhere. And as long as you, you trust that in your heart and you push the story forwards, you will end up somewhere. And the, the more experience you get doing that, the better you'll get at how you guide that and making something better, of course, but like you'll get somewhere. And we did. And it was really fun. Uh, that was one where like I came in with little expectations. I just wanted to try this. and things actually worked out really well. Um, the one I was like worried about on the show was actually, I was probably most worried about the watch. It was our first like true foray into a like really serious story. And the watch has like a very uh, like delicate set of themes, uh, like as far as like how you should approach and handle them. And it was just the first time we needed to like take that level of care, I would say on the on the show. And I was like super nervous going into that one because like, I was wondering if my notes were enough and I, I was like I was trying to figure out if the, the watch is also, it's a pretty crunchy PBTA game. Um, mm. it, it has some, some really um, distinct tech in it. Um, how it handles like missions and like you pre-roll for them and then you like narrate out how it goes. And it's, everything's mostly about the in-between times. There's lots of relation mechanics. There's like two kinds of like currency going up and down. Uh, it's, it's pretty like technically, um, it requires a little more thought. It's kind of like, uh, we mentioned Blades in the Dark offhand earlier, I think. Um, bit, bit D is, maybe we didn't, maybe I'm just, maybe I'm just mentioning it now. We're uh, mentioning it now. <laughs> Blades in the Dark is another one where it's like, it's got more crunch. It's deceptively crunchy um yeah as, as far as pbta games are concerned um and i was like really nervous going into that game and then by the time we got through the end of the first recording session i'm like no this is going really well and then at the end of the second one i was like that might have been the best eight hours i have ever gm'd like that, that was but it just turned out phenomenal um and we were like so excited at the end of that game and i did not think i was going to be hitting those levels of elation that we felt in resolving, you know, in those final few scenes, um, I did not feel like I did not think I was going to have those levels of elation when I started running that. I was so nervous about it. So, that's a great example. No, that was a that was a fantastic art. It's still up there, up there in the top two for me. Um, Monster of the Week always holds holds my oh man, <laughs> holds that I can't I can't let <laughs> it go just because it's one of my favorite systems. But my um, my goal with the Monster of the Week game was that we do something because like there's a ton of fantastic Monster of the Week podcasts. Um, and I didn't want to tread any ground that had already been tread so well by so many phenomenal shows. And I'm like, if we're going to, if we're going to play monster of the week on the show, we're going to do something that as far as I'm aware, people haven't particularly done with monster of the week yet, which was take it to space. Which is true. Speaking of just like of, of breaking yeah, molds, yeah. right? Like monster of the week is always taking place in places like, you know, cities, yep. forests, in et small et cetera, towns, et cetera, et cetera. big cities, small towns, things of that nature. Um, yeah, you took Monster of the Week and put it in space, uh, which is definitely not something I've ever seen any other 
scrape those serial app. numbers right I, off. <laughs> yep. Um, but no, that was a that was a, a great uh, a great arc. I, yeah. Was that your longest arc? I think it was until the between. Um, the between between finally beat it out by like an hour. Um, once everything was added up, uh, I have I have convenient Spotify playlists so I can see how long each of the arcs are because they they tabulate it for me. (laughs) Um, nice, very nice. But yeah, it it was the longest for a while. It (laughs) it definitely had the most recording sessions because we just couldn't we couldn't get anywhere in in one, and so we kept having to re-record. (laughs) Just because of the just the the absurdity of the back of, of the background, everything, or just the things. It, kept it was also bad. just the table. Um, it was it was the table. Uh, we kept having like issues with people like being there on time. So then like we when we'd start, we and we had like a table of people who like were really good friends, and so th- we had the the joke on that one that like uh, Jell and Pat just shared a brain cell, and that was like so true in person as well. Um, and uh, I mean, I think that. Arc still has our highest percent blooper to um, content ratio of I think forty percent. Forty percent bloopers for that arc is wild. Usually it's like twenty. It's it was like literally twice as much faffing in that arc as opposed to others. So yeah, no, it it was a tough one to finish, but we we did get there. We got to the end of the story. Listen, I as a Patreon appreciate <laughs> more bloopers. I just want you to know. So as a final, this uh, this uh, filing out all of this um is there anything that you've learned and taken from pbta and apply to other games outside of the pbta sphere because i know i have the last time i ran Mm dnd was a play test for um what's the 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 last not the one some of the last one is the rhyme of the frost Mm -hmm. maiden yeah that's a recent one and so my friends wanted to play it and i was like okay i'll run it but one of the things i dislike about dnd is the initiative turn order and it takes forever so i was like you know what everything else i'll run exactly like dnd whatever you know investigation get it yeah yeah. but when it comes to combat i'm gonna run this like a monster week dynamic combat so but i I didn't necessarily tell them i was gonna do that so there was like some i can't remember what the event was it was like goblins were trapping snow bears or something like that or polar bears and they ran across them because they got lost in the blizzard and as they go the person i had them all roll initiative and the and the the monk ran towards it and i just ran the the whole combat dynamically like i would in a cinematic mm-hmm. way still like incorporating the dnd initiative order but things happened not in a vacuum, yeah. which is what happens in D and D combat, and that's what it feels like. Like it happens all in a vacuum. Like, oh, you do this one thing, and then like, oh, then things yeah. happen, and it's like, no, it happens as you as you're doing it. That way, when the next person goes, something has already changed. Um, and they were just like, "What was that? What did you do?" Once we finished, I was like, "Oh, I run PBTA. Like this is how I run combat, and I'm just adjusting." And they're like, "Oh, we love that. Keep doing that." I was like, Done. "Perfect." <laughs> rubs hands together yes 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 that's good that's good uh oh man um i hadn't even thought about the how like running combat and and stuff in pbta has shaped how i treat it in dnd but like it definitely it definitely has um i think the number one thing that i felt like an idiot when i first read it and realized that it was just something because like i was like oh you can do that um, in in Brindlewood Bay, um, there are these things called paint the scene questions, uh, which are questions generally for locations, but they can also be for mysteries or for like opening scenes and et cetera, where you say, okay, here's where we are, or here's somebody you've met, or here's the scenario. And then you ask a, a leading, but like a pretty open leading question that like, for instance, uh, one we have in our Bit of Arrivals mystery um is like uh when you first so it, it's like takes place at a school mostly uh you're investigating a what happened to a particular teacher who was in the firebird costume if anyone's listened to the podcast has it's our, it's our burnwood big game we play on the arc um and uh, when you go to his classroom the paint the scene question for that is like what do you see around you that uh makes it clear that uh, uh rob kestrel the teacher 
has been living more in his classroom than at home. Um, and so like, it's, it's a leading question in that it's, it's already giving you the framework of like how to direct your energies, but then it also lets the players assign new information to the game. It's like, it's a little way to let them in on constructing the narrative because like what's in here could affect the scene. It could affect the world building depending on what they decide. Um, and when I first read that, I was like, oh, you can do that. Like I can just, I can just spin things around to the table ask the players to build my world and uh, i think the key thing what makes it not feel cheap to the players who are are looking for that like keeper to player dynamic as opposed to a more uh, open everyone is kind of the keeper um more flat uh structure at the table which also can be fun for for games don't get me wrong uh, but for players who are looking for that relationship by having the questions you ask be more structured it feels it, it it prevents asking those kinds of questions from feeling like there is no cohesion. Like it, it, it prevents the breaking of immersion, I think, um, because it means that the, the GM does have an intent here, um, but they're actually, they're letting you populate some of the details to flesh out that intent. But when you just ask like, oh, I don't know, you're in the room. I, I don't know, what do you see around you? That asking questions like that can be immersion breaking because to the players, it can seem like you don't even know what's going on, right? And, and for yeah. some, like, they want to have that trust in, in you running the table. And so learning about how Brindlewood Bay does paint the scene questions, and by extension, lots of other Car from Brindlewood games, um, I, I take that all the time into other stuff. I take that into other PBTA games I run that don't have it as a built-in mechanic. I take that to, uh, like, my D&D table uh, on my, my weekly game that will eventually finish. Um, and... Uh, It'll never finish, David. You, you say that we It'll we are finish. in we're in the final arc. We're in the back half. We are leading up to our big confrontation. Um, we have the denouement planned. It is coming. It's just not coming as quickly as I thought that it would. Um, <laughs> which isn't that D and D in a nutshell. Everything takes longer yeah. than you think until your players like accidentally speed run something. Um, we we did a, a Feywild arc where we were supposed to go do all this stuff to like prevent this historical war from happening because we were in the past at the time and we we lovingly refer to it as the Feywild speed run because a combination of good dice rolls and like really clever moves by the players basically outmaneuvered every challenge I had set for them there and instead of like accomplishing it in the course of like in-game like a couple of months they did it in like one week uh and got like in in and out stopped everything moved on to the next part of the story and it Sometimes that's just how the, the unpredictability of uh, tabletop is one of the things that keeps me coming back to it. Things really can go pretty much any way, and you won't know until you play it to find out. It is one of the one of the best things is surprise in yeah. a game. I, actually, that is the biggest thing I took away from playing PBTA is that attitude of play to find out. Um, that is something yeah. that absolutely is present at all of my tables it does not matter how much stuff i prepared it does not matter what game i am running um we at that table will be playing to find out and that's always fun it's the best part and speaking of playing to find out david do you want to play a game do you want to play a game with me david oh, yes mr saucer i'd love to play oh. a game oh. Oh. You know, I only liked actually the first first move, first of those movies. The rest of them, I'm like, eh. I have not seen any of them because I cannot watch horror. Oh, that's interesting because we're actually going to be playing. A I know game. It, it's really funny to me, um, especially people on the show. They mention all the time that uh, David likes to hurt his friends, um, and <laughs> and that uh, I love horror trappings. Um, I, I bring them in whenever possible. I, I love to to describe the horrific, um, partly because I love to do comedies and horror and comedy just are are such good friends because the it's all about the gap, right? You know, uh, and when you can plunge people to the depths of despair, it is that much easier to make them chuckle at something being out of place. I cannot watch. I can read horror. I can, for the most part, listen to it, but I can't watch it because like i have this strange there, there's some people when they're like at the table they really insert themselves into it and so like it can like really stress them out to like deal with particular you know uh scenes and themes uh for me it's like if i'm watching a film i'm like laser focused into it and so horror 
like it does things to my body that I do not like. And so I, mm-hmm. I can't watch it. I have the, I have the same problem with horror, uh, watching it. I mind listening to it. I don't mind yeah. reading it, um, uh, playing it same. Um, uh, but watching it on the screen and stuff, uh, I have a hard time. Um, first one was more of like psychological. So I think that's mm-hmm. why, uh, the rest of them are just in, same thing with like black mirror that's why i like black mirror it's more psychological than, than most um okay well let's, let's uh let's get prepared and then uh we'll get started with our game so we'll be right, we'll be right back if you would like to be a guest on the show please email guest at more shoddy plays dot games with your contact information thank you for listening to wish i could play